I wonder what makes you happy. What brings you joy? I wonder, as I say that, you're probably thinking of something. Perhaps it's, you know, those big moments in life. You know, when a child is born or, you know, that, um, you know, when you've succeeded in something and your parents tell you they're proud of you or maybe your wedding day or the love of a spouse maybe it's big things like that you think about them and you fill with joy or maybe it's just the simple everyday things you know your team winning a good meal a thoughtful gift I wonder what makes you particularly joyful at Christmas Perhaps for you, it's, uh, if you've got kids, maybe it's watching the kids open that present that you've picked out for them. Or maybe, if you are a kid, uh, or an adult even, it's opening the present that's been picked out for you. Maybe the thing that brings you joy at Christmas is seeing all the family together, even if it isn't perfect. Good food, good drink, lights, decorations, music. There are so many things that bring us joy at Christmas. But what if you didn't have any of those things? What if at Christmas you lost all of those things? Could you still be joyful? Would you still be able to be joyful if you'd lost your appetite, lost your presence, your job, your money, your security? What about if you even lost your family? It almost doesn't bear thinking of, does it? It's a sad thing to think about in any sort of depth. But what if that was all taken away from you? Would you have any grounds for joy? Sometimes, you know, we ask, asking ourselves questions like that and thinking deeply about that reality, as sad as it may make us feel, as uncomfortable as it may be, it often reveals something quite profound. And yet probably not surprising. Our joy, so often, is circumstantial. Our joy is tied to our circumstances. So we find joy when things are going well, when life is going well. But when life is hard, we don't experience joy. Is that really all that joy is? Is joy just a good feeling that we have when everything's going well? Or is joy, is real joy, deeper and greater than that? Well, of course, real joy given to us in church through Jesus is. Church life has given us a deep well of joy to drink from. And we have found that the key to joy is found in waiting Real, true and lasting joy is not rooted in the immediate. It's not found in the things that are happening immediately around us. Real joy is found in waiting and anticipating something better. Which, as we've already seen, is what Advent is all about. Advent is about waiting for that better thing, for Jesus. So, what are we waiting for in Advent? Where should we be looking for our joy to come from? I wonder what we're looking forward to at Christmas. Maybe we're looking forward to some good food. I mean, I'm looking forward to some good food this afternoon, actually. I've seen what you've all brought for our Slow Cooker Sunday. Uh, Maybe we're looking forward to getting a present or two at Christmas. Maybe we're looking forward to seeing some family. Maybe we're looking forward to feasting and wine. But wine... Food, family, friends, do those things bring joy? Now, maybe because of the way I've put that question, you're expecting me to say, no, they don't bring joy. But actually, they do. Those things do bring joy. Of course they do. And the Bible agrees. So I I sometimes think that people who haven't read the Bible, but have heard things about it, must often think the Bible is a really boring and miserable book. And that's partly because that's often the way Christians talk about it. We're the problem. But it's not. The Bible is full of joy. And it's super interesting to see all the sorts of things the Bible says that bring us joy. You see, the world 
And the things in it are not bad. They're good. That's what God said in the beginning when he made everything. He made the whole world and he said, it is good. And so naturally, we find joy in good things. And so in Psalm 65, we read that we find joy in an abundant harvest, in growing flocks and healthy fields. In Jeremiah 33, we see that weddings bring joy. Joy for the bride and the groom, but also for those who are there watching. In Psalm 104, wine brings joy. And in Proverbs 23, it is children who bring joy to their parents, specifically righteous children. In Proverbs 29, perfume brings joy, as does the closeness of friends. The Bible tells us that all of these are sources of joy. And so we should rejoice in these good gifts. But are those the things we should be looking forward to? Can we always find joy in these things? Are they dependable sources of joy? I think we instinctively know that the answer is, no, they're not. Because although all these things are good, and they do bring us joy, they only bring us joy whilst we have them. They don't bring a lasting joy. Crops go bad, herds diminish, weddings end. Sometimes, sadly, marriages end. Wine is finished, perfume loses its scent, children walk away from Jesus, and friends leave us. The joy these things bring are bound in the circumstances of having them. But we can't always have them, can we? Not every day is weddings and wine. So the joy they bring, though real, is not lasting. Boys and girls, I bet you're a bit excited about getting a present at Christmas, yeah? And that's okay. That's okay. But the present that you might feel happy and excited about on Christmas morning will not, probably, bring you joy in a month's time, or two months' time, or three months' time. It will, it will break. You will lose it. You will get bored of it. Don't let your joy be about getting a present. Because if that is what we are most excited about, then eventually we're going to be disappointed. Because presents are are great, but they don't last forever. We need something better. But why, why do we need something better? Why do we even need something to bring us joy? Well, because I don't know if you've noticed, but life isn't one long joyride, is it? I don't know, maybe yours is, but mine certainly isn't. We'll just leave that there for now, okay? Just leave that. Life is not one long joyride. Life isn't a constant barrage of good gifts. There are times when those things that bring joy are missing from our lives. So what do we do in those times when we don't have those things? Can we only have joy when we have nice things and everything's going well? Or is it possible to have joy even when things are hard? And when everything is not going well? Is it possible to have joy even when we are poor, ill, lonely, things are going wrong at work, things are going wrong at home? The good news the Bible gives us is yes, yes. You see, your life is not one long joyride, but neither is the story of the Bible. Sometimes people read the Bible and they misunderstand the Bible because it's got some really bad stuff in there. The Bible, sometimes people criticise the Bible for having slavery in it, murder, rape and other terrible things. But these are not things that God endorses. These are not things that God says is good. No, they are not things that exist because of God. They are things that exist because of people. And so the Lord God does not whitewash his retelling of human history. You see, when the Lord God speaks to us, he isn't delusional. 
He isn't confused about the state of the world. He's not oblivious to the suffering and pain that we experience. And so when he speaks to us and calls us to live lives full of joy, he doesn't ignore the hard things. He's not speaking, he's not saying, hey, be joyful, uh, and speaking to us, believing that we live in some sort of ideal life, some ideal in perfect circumstances. No, the, the living God is intensely practical. And so he shows us how to live joyful lives, even in this broken world. That's why the Bible is so full of broken stories and broken people. To show us broken people, living out our own broken stories, how to do so with joy. Because the story of the Bible is marked by death and loss. We saw a bit of it there in Jeremiah, didn't we? These things that happened. And so the Bible offers a unique perspective on joy. It shows us that the joy that it offers is not only available to you if you have some perfect ideal life. No, it's a joy that meets us in the muck. That meets us when we're down that meets us when everything else is going wrong. Well, how can that be? How can I have joy when literally everything is going to pop? Everything's falling to pieces, it's falling to pieces. Well, we can have that because joy is not our circumstances. Joy is an attitude that God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promises. And we see this time and time again throughout the story of the Bible. So when Israel are in slavery in Egypt, suffering, what did God do? He raised up Moses to free them. And what's the first thing they did when they left Egypt? They sang for joy. They were still in the desert. They hadn't reached the promised land. But they sang for joy. They were vulnerable. They were, the promised land was still far away but they rejoiced anyway. Their present circumstances were still not great, but they trusted the Lord God, and they trusted the future that he promised them. This joy found in the wilderness was a defining moment for the church, because it is the pattern of what real church life looks like. It's what your life should look like every single day. The joy of God's people is not defined by their struggles, but by Jesus being present with us. Jesus was with Israel in the wilderness, in that towering pillar of cloud and fire. The living God was with them. And so, yes, while they were waiting for the promised land, the really faithful Israelite could see they already had everything they needed right there because Jesus was with them. Even in that difficult circumstances, circumstance in the desert, they weren't alone. Jesus was at the center. He was with them. And so they looked forward to a day when that reality would be even more solid, as it were. When God would take on flesh and live with them. You see, Christian joy can be found in the deepest dungeon or the driest desert or the loneliest heights even in the pit of despair, because it's not our circumstances that define our joy, but the one who is with us in every circumstance. Isaiah looked for a day when the Lord would raise up a new deliverer like Moses. He says, when the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The ancient church was awaiting the arrival of joy. But their joy was not only found in their future. God's promises were so real to them, they were so confident of God's faithfulness, that they could begin to enjoy that future now, in their present circumstances. And so Israel chose to wait with joy. And so it's really significant 
Here is Israel waiting for joy to arrive, this future promise of joy, and then when Jesus is born, it is announced as great good news of great joy. That's what we read, didn't we? The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. This is the event, this is the arrival, this is the king that Israel and the whole world have been waiting for. The kingdom of heaven was coming upon the earth, and it is news that is full of joy. In fact, Jesus himself in Luke chapter 10 said that he rejoiced to see the proclamation of the kingdom of God. But why? Why was this news of such great joy? Well, because Jesus had come to be the human that heaven and earth had always dreamed of. In the beginning, right at the beginning, when there was only God, he made everything, he made humanity. Before he, before he made humanity, God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit dreamed a dream of what humanity should be. And they said, let's make them in our own image. Let's let them live with us. Let's let them rule with us. Let's let them work with us. Let's give them the whole world that they may fill it with beauty and order. That they would love creation. They dreamed that we would rule the world in tenderness and mercy. That there would be peace and that the good creation that God had made would flourish under our care. But instead, humanity rejected the light of heaven. We plunged ourselves into darkness and we took the whole creation with us. We turned away from the living God and everything that was designed to bring life and joy broke. But like a Kind of like a toddler that's found this, you know, beautiful, intricate, delicate vase and has just dropped it on the floor. Everything good has been broken. The world was no longer a place of perpetual joy. Joy was no longer the default mood of creation. Despair was. And that's what we feel, don't we? We despair. We feel despair. We despair of work, of relationships of, of parenting perhaps children you despair of parents <laughs> our bodies get sick and break and hurt and we die we don't feel this perpetual joy that we were designed for and so there needed to be a new humanity a second Adam one who would restore joy to the world the psalmist wrote of this day in Psalm 96. He said, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then, the, then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. Well, here is that king. He's King Jesus. He's come to restore creation. He's come to live the human life that we were always meant to live, to rule perfectly, to bring peace, to enjoy the world. And so the night that Jesus is born, all creation rejoices. The angels come and they play their part, heralding the coming king. And the stars in heaven align and shine a spotlight on his birth. Even the oxen come and serve him at his manger, we read in Job 39. Joy has come upon the earth. There is once again hope for creation. After all the barren years of broken humans, a true human has arrived. And humanity can rejoice. And so Christ, he is the perfume. He is the fragrance among those who are perishing, 2 Corinthians 2. And he is the perfume that will never lose its scent. He is the wine that gladdens the hearts. But he is also the grapes 
that when crushed, pour forth life-giving blood that never spoils, never runs out, that our cup may always overflow. He is the child, the righteous Son of God, who brings joy to the Father, who never disappoints and is always righteous, and who shares his perfect righteousness with his brothers and sisters, with us. And his is the wedding in which all creation shall eternally rejoice. A wedding without any end. You see, there is no end to the joy that Jesus brings. And so, if you know him, if you have him, and you are filled with his life, then whatever's going on around you really isn't significant compared to him, to having him. Do you see? If you know the joy of heaven in Jesus, then what have your circumstances really got to do with anything? Jesus continued to teach the same joy in the wilderness to his disciples, just as he had previously taught them in the wilderness under Moses. And so in Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He says, when that happens, rejoice and be glad. Why? For your reward is great in heaven. We rejoice that dawn has that joy has dawned upon the earth. But there is still a revelation of joy in our future. The church still looks to the, his future arrival, his future return, when he will gather us up into his eternal presence, into the renewed creation. Your ability to rejoice has nothing to do with your current circumstances and everything to do with Jesus. After his death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and tell the good news that he was indeed the risen king of the world. And as they did, they were persecuted. Many of them were killed in gruesome ways. But what they had learned from Jesus stayed with them. And they rejoiced even as they were being murdered. Acts 13, 52, we read about that. And this is a thing about being a Christian. Because of Jesus, you are free to choose joy. The Apostle Paul believed that joy was a gift of God's Spirit, a sign that his presence was with you, inspiring hope even in the midst of heartache. And so Paul, even while Paul, he knew, he knew what it was to be locked up. He was locked up in a Roman prison. Even there he could say, he says, I have chosen joy. And in Philippians he calls it the joy of faith and the joy of the Lord. This is the freedom of being a Christian. Whatever's going on around you, even if they come and lock you away, you are free in Christ to be joyful. Now, if you are not filled with the life of Jesus, if you're not a Christian and you haven't come in to be part of the new humanity in church life, then you're not free to choose joy. You are stuck with your circumstances dictating how you feel at any given moment. You may indeed experience joy in those good things that God has made, in, in wine and family and perfume and friends and all those good things. But in the absence, when those things are taken away, in the hardship of life, without Jesus, there is no source of joy for you to tap into. You can only ever have circumstantial joy, never eternal joy without Jesus. But you can choose him. You can follow him. You can be filled with his life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are always free to choose joy. The trouble is, we don't always do that, do we? I don't know if you've ever been irritated by a joyful person. I know I have. 
You know what it's like? You're not really having a good day. Things aren't going the way you would like. You're not feeling particularly joyful. And then somebody breezes into the room or you know, into church and they're, they're upbeat, they're joyful. And there's part of it, maybe this is just me, but there's part of us which is annoyed by their cheerful demeanor. It's like, why are you so happy? Do you ever feel like that? And we usually come to one of two conclusions. We either say to ourselves, well, their life obviously isn't as hard as my life. That's why they can be joyful. If they were going through what I am, well, they wouldn't be joyful. So we conclude it's all joys about circumstances. Or we go the other way and we conclude, oh, they're so fake. They're so fake. No, no way anyone can be that joyful all the time. Why can't they just be honest like I am? <laughs> yeah? Why do we struggle to choose joy? When we struggle to be joyful or when we struggle with somebody else's joyfulness, it isn't because our life is harder than other people's. It isn't because other people are fake, and it isn't because we are tired. It is because we are struggling with faith. It's because we're struggling to trust Jesus. Oh, no, 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 I still trust Jesus. No, that's not it. I still believe Jesus died on the cross, paid for my sins, has risen again, has secured my pardon. I still believe. No, you don't. You might believe academically. You might even be able to... Say it with your lips, but you don't believe that it really matters. You don't believe that what Jesus has done changes things. And you don't really believe that it's true. Because if you believe that with all your heart, all the time, you can never not be joyful. When you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, then truly nothing else matters. Joy becomes the only reasonable thing to be. Even in the darkest of circumstances. And so Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always. Rejoice always. And maybe you're now thinking, oh no, Doug. You're not one of those insufferable, you know, smile, Jesus loves you kind of people, are you? Well, I don't think that I am. But maybe I should be. Maybe I should be. You see, calls to be joyful can often be characterised as, well, you're just saying, smile, Jesus loves you. And we, we do that because then we can dismiss it as glib and cheesy and, and ignore the main points of what they're actually saying. Well, you know, if you knew the complex situation, if you knew my heartache, if you knew what sort of day I had, if you knew the diagnosis I just received, you wouldn't say something as trite as that. And maybe it's true, maybe the form of words is trite, but the truth is anything but. What about if instead of saying, smile, Jesus loves you, maybe if we said, lift your drooping arms, straighten your arching back, stir your soul, for Christ the blessed man lives. He has lived your life, he has died your death, he has secured your eternal favour with the Father and he's coming back to take you home. There is nothing you can do to cause him to abandon you and there is no way his spirit will ever leave you or his Father ever turn his back on you. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Jesus loves you. Is that better? Amen. The reason we resist the calls to be joyful in those moments is nothing to do with the triteness of the saying and everything to do with the condition of our hearts. We don't want to be joyful in those moments. We don't don't want to snap out of it. We don't want to stop being angry or frustrated. Why? Well, maybe we don't know, but we find some sort of sinful solace in our foul mood. And we know that if someone causes us to genuinely think upon Christ, then we will have to rejoice. And for whatever messed up reason, in that moment, we don't want to. What's wrong with us? Why are we like this? We are like Jonah to our own souls. When you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, Joy becomes the only reasonable response. 
And so the call this morning is to choose joy. It is yours. You are free to choose it at any moment and in any circumstance. Joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' own life and love. And it's available to you. The shepherds chose that joy in the wilderness. Here on the night of Jesus' birth, out in the fields were shepherds. Hardy men with hard lives. It wasn't this romantic idea of being a shepherd. It was a hard life being a shepherd. They were not well regarded. They were not well thought of. If kings were up here and you know, uh, tax collectors and bankers and everything else, shepherds were at the bottom. No one wanted to be a shepherd. Nobody cared about shepherds. They were rough men doing rough work. And joy comes to them. Not to some king in a palace, but to the bottom of the social ladder, Christ comes. And when joy comes to them, what do they say? Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. And they find, when they get there, they find the source of all joy in the universe. Wrapped in swaddling cloths. And lying in a manger. And what was their response? The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. Christ had come from the highest heaven to the lowest ladder of society. Come for the downtrodden and the outcasts. For people whose life had not been easy. If your life has not been easy, you might think, well, there's no way. Christ, you know, Jesus must only be for those other people. Not for me. You'd be wrong. He has come for everyone, especially those whose life has not been easy. Life does feel like a wilderness sometimes, right? Sometimes it's hard and lonely. You, you don't know where you're going. And you don't know how long it's going to take you to get there. You just know you have to do one more day. Take one more step. Sometimes life does feel like a lonely wilderness. But remember, you're not alone. God has stepped down and joined us. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, the world may tell you that it's a reason to mourn. The world may tell you, oh, that's happened. Well, I guess that's, you know, there's nothing good here then. But Jesus always comes to you with the eternal reason to rejoice. He can always be with you if you will just ask him to be. He can always be with you if you will just walk with him. Maybe this coming Christmas feels a, like it might be a bit of a wilderness experience. Maybe, maybe you're dreading it. Maybe you're like, do you know what, Doug? I'm not looking forward to Christmas. It's not the most wonderful time of the year. But this Christmas, whatever happens, we are free to choose joy, regardless of our circumstances. For Christ has come. How can we not be joyful. All glory be to Jesus. Amen.